Ja, mein Name ist Dave. I get to be the pastor at Mosaic, and I love that you found your way uh, to this space. We're grateful for the church that normally meets here on Sunday mornings, that they allow us to meet here uh, and still um, not skip church for two weeks. That would be a disaster, right? <laughs> But we want to be together and uh, worship together, be with each other, uh, connect with some of the new faces that are here. Some of you are here for the first time. Welcome, guys. I hope you're already feel at home among us. And uh, today I just want to share um, some thoughts uh, uh, from, um, uh, we're actually going to look at the book of Nehemiah today. It's a book in the Old Testament. If you've um, never read it, don't worry about it. It's a bit of an uh, interesting book. It's actually just his journal. I think it's because he's writing from his own perspective and we can learn a lot from Nehemiah. So if you have some of the verses are on your piece of paper, uh, if not, take out your phones or your Bibles if you brought them and read along as we go. But let me start here. Uh, it's now sort of the end of the summer. I always find that kind of end of August, early uh, September is, is sort of the kickoff of a new season, isn't it? Like we've, uh, I know football season started again. Some had a good start, some other teams not so good. But that started again, and the school year has started this last week, and uh, university is about to start again very soon. And it's kind of this is feeling of, hey, summer is over. We've hopefully recharged our batteries Right? Some of you are still hoping to go on vacation, maybe now in September. But most of us have recharged our batteries, and it's now kind of like, okay, what's next? God, what do you have for me? God, what do you have for us as a church? And uh, there's maybe you have some goals that you are setting or some new dreams that you are setting. Are you okay with my voice? It's a bit echoey, isn't it? Uh, just about okay. If you just turn it down a bit, and I can maybe. Uh, anyway, so we're setting new dreams. We have new goals, and uh, we're kind of... Um, Like, God, what do you have for us? Maybe you're doing that for your career, that you're saying, hey, between now and Christmas or between now and next year, here's my goal for my career, my next step I want to take. Maybe you're doing that with your education. Maybe you have uh, kind of your finals coming up soon and there's kind of the last semesters maybe uh, that you're kind of going into your final year maybe and you're setting up some goals, having some dreams about that. Maybe you have some goals and dreams for your relationships, for your health, for your fitness, maybe even your spiritual life. Kind of like in the beginning of the year, we have these New Year's resolutions. Uh, kind of September feels like that as well. Is it just me? Or like, does it for you as well? Yeah, sort of. I know it feels like that for us as a church as well. I know kind of we're going into a new season now. We're soon starting a new term with small groups. And we have faith that God has things in store for us, things that he wants us to pursue in this next weeks and months. And um, we long for God to use us in Berlin, to be a blessing for this city. Amen? That's our deep longing for us as a church. And uh, whenever God uses us, whenever God calls us and we say yes to this call, um, there are oppositions that we face. There's headwinds. Like every, th there is no opportunity without opposition. Would you agree? Some of you have pursued some big opportunities in your life and you had to overcome some obstacles and some big challenges in your life. And the question is, how do we deal with this And this is where Nehemiah, I believe, can be so helpful for us. Because Nehemiah, um, I think he's one of the greatest leaders in the entire Bible. Probably next to Jesus, I find him so impressive as a leader. He was sharp. He was a man of vision. He was a catalyst. He was a vision caster. He was an enabler. He was positive. He was uh, ambitious. He had focus. He had courage. He had integrity. Uh, and he became known uh, in the Old Testament as the man who rebuilt the walls around the city of Jerusalem after the city had been burned down, okay? So protective walls at the time were crucial for the city to thrive because that was your defense. Now we have kind of other ways to defend ourselves, but back then, if you had a good wall, you're safe. If you don't have a wall, you have a problem, okay? And so they, he, he made sure there was safety and flourishing in Jerusalem. Now, just to give you a bit of a context, before we dive into what I want to talk about. The uh, story of Nehemiah is set in, uh, uh, in the Old Testament, as I said, after um, the people of Israel were in exile. Some of you know the people of Israel, they were invaded by the Babylonians, and the Babylonians had actually taken them into exile, where they were captives for decades. And then, at some point, the Babylonian Empire fell to the Persian Empire, And the Persians, they were a bit more relaxed about their prisoners. And at some point, they said to the people of Israel, hey, if you want to, you can also go back to your home country. 
And for them, that was good news. And it's like, yes, let's go back to, to Jerusalem, to our city, to our temple. And when they returned, they realized everything had been destroyed. The whole city had been burnt down, right? Most of the Jews had now returned back to Israel. There was still a remnant of Jews who lived in Persia. One of them was Nehemiah. He stayed, I believe, because he had a pretty good life in Persia. He worked in the citadel of Susa, which was kind of like the winter residence of King Artaxerxes, who was the son of King Xerxes, who we talked about earlier this year already. King Artaxerxes, he was the ruler of the mighty Persian Empire. And Nehemiah, he was the cupbearer of King Artaxerxes, who actually brought him his drink. So we're not really sure what that means, if he had to try the drink to see if it was poisoned, or kind of like, what was that about? We kind of think he was the head waiter of King Artaxerxes in his winter residence in the citadel of Susa. And so he had, he had a nice life there to li live and work in the palace. And then at some point, we read in the first chapter of Nehemiah that a guy named Hanani, who was the brother of Nehemiah, Hanani had actually returned to Jerusalem, and now Hanani came for a visit back to see Nehemiah. And Nehemiah was all excited, and he wanted to see, hey, what's it like in the promised land? Tell me, what's the situation? And he was hoping to kind of, for Hanani to paint a beautiful picture. But Hanani described the opposite. Hanani was saying, actually, the whole situation is a disaster. The walls had been burnt down, and all the surrounding tribes are making fun of us, and they can come in and out the city as they please and plunder and take what is not theirs and they take it away from us, and we're defenseless, and we feel defeated, and we feel discouraged. Uh, and, and that's a really, like he painted a really bad picture uh, of, of the situation. And um, what was Nehemiah's response? Did he create an Instagram hashtag? to create awareness <laughs> of, hey, thoughts and prayers for Jerusalem? Or did he, did he blow up balloons to start a march for Jerusalem, right? To let everybody know that this situation is a disaster. Or, or did he kind of start a fundraising campaign to raise money so the wall could be rebuilt? Actually, he didn't do any of this. We read, it's not on your piece of paper yet, but if you have your Bibles in chapter 1, verse 4, he writes, when I heard these things, when I heard this report from my brother Hanani, I sat down and I wept. For some days I mourned and fasted and prayed. What is the essence of a call from God? The calling from God does not start when you see an opportunity that you might be able to fill. The calling from God also does not start when you do a gift assessment of your own spiritual gifts. It's like, here's what I'm really good at. Here's what I should do. The essence of a call from God is when God breaks your heart for something, for a cause or a people or some situation. That's where it started for Nehemiah. When I heard these things, it broke my heart. I had to sit down. I had to weep. I fasted. I prayed. I mourned for days before um, my God. That's what he's saying. In the 1950s, some of you would have heard of a man maybe called Bob Pierce. Uh, Bob Pierce was, uh, in the 1950s, he was kind of a, a preacher. He was a pastor. Later on, he became known because he, uh, he started some big uh, organizations. But in the 1950s, that was around the time when there was a war in Korea. And he was an American, but he went to, the, uh, to Korea and he saw just the, the, the brokenness of, of the situation there and, and orphans and just poverty and, and sickness and death and all of that. And he wrote in his Bible, after he, he saw this, moved obviously, he wrote in his Bible uh, a simple prayer. He says, Lord, let my heart be broken by the things that break your heart. Guys, if you take nothing else from this message today, take this prayer along with you. Start praying it. It will change your life. I promise you that. Lord, let my heart be broken with the things that break your heart. Bob Pierce, later on, he founded an organization called World Vision and another organization called Samaritan's Purse. Maybe you've heard of them. They do the shoeboxes, right? Uh, but I, I think for him, it didn't start with, hey, here could be a great enterprise. For him, it started with a broken heart. God moved him. God loves to use people who care about the things that he cares about. God loves to use people who are moved by the things that move his heart. Make sense? And so... Let me say this, actually. To God, 
when He calls you, He doesn't look nearly as much as you think at your ability. He looks at your credibility. He looks at your dependability. He looks at your availability. Let me say that again. He, he doesn't look nearly as much as you think at your ability. He looks at your um, credibility, your dependability, and your availability. Here I am, Lord. Break my heart for the things that break your heart. And now Nehemiah, his heart was broken. He started to weep. He started to pray, to mourn. He says for days. Um, actually, we know how long it was. It was actually for four months. He prayed, and he brought this concern to God. And then four months later, he went to the king, Artaxerxes, and he asked the king for permission to be released from his duties in the palace so that he could go back to Jerusalem and rebuild the wall uh, around the city. And King Artaxerxes, he granted his request. More than that, he actually sent supplies along <laughs> With Nehemiah, and that's quite surprising. Like, why was King Artaxerxes so sympathetic to um, his cause? Now, those of you who paid attention, remember the um, the father of Artaxerxes was Xerxes the Great. Artaxerxes was was the third son of Xerxes the Great. Xerxes the Great was married to Queen Esther, who we talked about earlier this year when we had a whole series on Queen Esther. Esther was Jewish. And so we don't know actually whether Esther was Artaxerxes' mom, but for sure she definitely was a stepmom. If she wasn't a mom, she was a stepmom. And for Artaxerxes, he probably saw that influence that, oh, my, my mom or my stepmom is Jewish. That was a blessing on his life. And that's why I believe he wanted to bless Nehemiah and see that Jerusalem is safe and, and uh, can flourish. And so Nehemiah, he left for Jerusalem. I saw in, in one of the commentaries on this, it said that the, the journey from the citadel of Susa to Jerusalem takes you three and a half months by camel. <laughs> okay, right. It wasn't around the corner, guys. What does that mean? What does that mean? It means that Nehemiah, when he left, he closed the door behind him. He burned his bridges behind him. There was no going back for him. It wasn't like, hey, I'm going to go to Nehemiah to see if I could do something And then if it doesn't work out, I can still go back to my day job in, this, in, this, in the palace in Susa. No, he, there was no going back. He knew he was called. He, he was praying about this, chewing about this, like on this for, for months and months and months. And now he was ready to go to Jerusalem. And when he arrived in Jerusalem, he did what any good leader would do. He inspected things for himself. He gathered the facts. He actually, um, on a horse, he went around the city to just look at this, at the, at the, situation and kind of the condition of the wall or what was left of it. And then he made a plan and then he gathered all the people and he said, hey, we have a big problem. The situation is not good, but come. He says in chapter 2, verse 17, he says, come, let us rebuild the wall of Jerusalem. And then they start this building project. And as they rebuild the wall over the next days and weeks, they were faced with three different kinds of oppositions. Three different kinds of um, headwinds, kind of pushbacks that they felt. And I want to suggest to you today that if you set out in your life to accomplish something for God, if God has called you or you kind of moved by something, it's like, I want to do this for God. I, I feel like, or we as a church even, us together, we want to do this for God. We want to, we're going to take more territory for God. All of this thing. When, when we go out like this and we follow a call like this, an assignment like this, I guarantee you, you will face the same three oppositions that Nehemiah also faced. And the question is, how do we deal with these oppositions? It's actually a test of your leadership, a test of your character of what do you do when you face opposition? What do you do when you are under pressure? Like, do you freeze? Do you freak out? Do you blow up? Do you throw in the towel? Like, like what do you do kind of when, when you're under pressure? Uh, and we need to learn this, and I think we can learn things from Nehemiah. So you're interested? Yes? All right. Okay. So in every story, they are obviously the good guys and the bad guys. The good guy, the protagonist in the story is Nehemiah. The bad guys, the antagonists in the story are uh, three guys. One guy is named Sanbalat. I know, great name. If you're looking for baby names, just throwing that in as well. Sanbalat, right? <laughs> Don't do it. He was a bad guy. Sanvalad. Anybody here named Sanvalad? Sorry. Good. Okay. Just making sure. Sanvalad, he was a Horonite. Okay. There was a tribe around Jerusalem. 
to be a, not to buy, to be a, he was an Ammonite and Geshem the Arab. Okay, those were the three bad guys in the story. Now let's pick up the story in chapter four. If you have a piece of paper, just read along or on your phones or wherever. Uh, Sanballat was very angry when he learned that we were rebuilding the wall. He flew into a rage and mocked the Jews, saying in front of his friends and the Samaritan army officers, what does this bunch of poor, feeble Jews think they're doing? Do they think they can build the wall in a single day by just offering a few sacrifices? Do they actually think they can make something of stones from a rubbish heap and charred ones at that? And then Tobiah, the Ammonite, who was standing beside him, he also had some remarks. Do you see how when you make fun of people, it's always contagious, Right? Uh, to be like he thinks, oh, let's, let's make fun of them. And he says, well, that stone wall would collapse if even a fox would walk along the top of it. What is the first opposition that Nehemiah was facing and the first opposition that we face almost always right in the beginning when you, we start to do something new? It's the, it's the opposition of ridicule. Ridicule. If you want to write that down, ridicule. It's like you, you face it right in the beginning. What are those feeble Jews think they're doing? Who do you think you are? What do you think, you, what, what do you think you're doing here? Do you think you can make a difference here in this city? Some of you have heard this, maybe sp spoken out loud of, or kind of someone kind of indirectly said it. like, what do you think you're doing coming to Berlin? I know some of you here sitting like, hey, you came here because God called you to be here in ministry and stuff. And maybe you've heard exactly this thing. What do you think you're doing? Who do you think you are that God brings you here to this city? And who do you think you are that God actually would make a difference through you? Ridicule is a powerful tool, guys. It's powerful. Let's make no mistake about it. There, there are books written about this, about kind of psychological warfare in the marketplace, right? How to psych out your competition, right? A hundred ways to, to kind of outsmart your competition, through ridicule. It's a very powerful tool. It's also a very effective tool. It's a very effective tool because it, it, it attacks our sense of self-worth. When you're being ridiculed, you're feeling intimidated, intimidated and you're actually feeling inadequate, right? It's like, oh, maybe they're right. Maybe I'm not good enough, right? It's, it's powerful, it's effective, but it's also quite a revealing tool. It's quite a desperate tool because ridicule shows that the other person is afraid of you. It's a sign of fear when somebody ridicules you because they're afraid you're going to succeed with what you're set out to do. Okay? And maybe you want to write this down. I am not what others think or say about me. I'm not what others think or say about me. If you have any ambition in your life right now, any goals, any dreams that you pursue, if you feel like in this next season, I feel God's called me, uh, something he wants me to do, you, you can count on it. You're going to be ridiculed. You're going to be laughed at. Some people will criticize you or just kind of smile at you, like, kind of like really? <laughs> They're, They're going to laugh at your dreams. Um, and the only way not to be criticized, if you don't want to be criticized, then do nothing, <laughs> say nothing, be nothing, then you're not going to be criticized. But as soon as you set out kind of to, to do something, you're going to be uh, ridiculed. Um, once you say yes to uh, God's call, somebody's going to mock your ideas. Because even the enemy knows this. The devil comes and he's playing with this ridicule because he knows an intimidated Christian is an ineffective Christian. He said that again. An intimidated Christian is an ineffective Christian. And that's why he wants to come again and again to intimidate you. He's going to come to you and say things like, you are unqualified for this. You're not good enough. You're not talented enough. There's other people who can do better than this. You're not qualified enough. You're unqualified. Or, he says, not unqualified. He says, you're disqualified for this. You have the talents. You have everything for this. But there's things in your past that disqualify you. There's things in your story where you've messed up or things were done to you, they disqualify you, and therefore, God cannot use you. Have you heard that one? Here's one line that the enemy uses all the time. I think he uses it with all of us. <laughs> he comes to us, and he says, God cannot use you because you don't pray enough. Have you heard that one? God cannot use you because you don't pray enough. It's like, oh, and then it gives you kind of this feeling of guilt and, man, prayer becomes a burden. It's like, I should pray more so God can finally use me, but I don't pray enough. And 
Like the thing is, like how much is enough? Maybe you feel like, oh, oh yeah, I guess I got to pray. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pray 10 minutes every day. Hopefully then God can use me. And then the enemy comes and says, 10 minutes? Is that all you have? Do you think God's can, God can use you if you pray for 10 minutes? Don't you know an hour a day keeps the devil away? Right? You should pray for an hour. And then you get, okay, I got to try to pray for one hour every day so God can finally use me. And then you pray for one hour, and the enemy comes again. It's like, one hour? Is that all you have? One hour? Is that all you can give to your God? Haven't you heard of the principle of tithing? 10% belongs to the Lord. That's not just true for your money. That's true for your time as well. You should, if the day has 24 hours, you should give 2.4 hours in prayer to the Lord every day. And you go like, okay, I got to pray for two and a half hours every day. Please the Lord so he can finally use me. And then you pray for 2.4 hours every day, and the enemy comes back to you again. He says, 2.4 hours, is that all you have? Haven't you heard? Pray without ceasing. That's what Paul says. You should pray all the time, right? And the thing is, you can't, look, you can't win with this. Like, never argue with the devil. He's smarter than you. He really is. He will outsmart you. Don't, Nehemiah, he didn't play along this game when, when they started to ridicule him. It's, it's amazing. He just, he just ignored it. The enemy wants you to feel weak. And then he tells you the lie, because you feel weak, because you are weak, God cannot use you. Here's a secret, guys. God loves to use weak people. Right? In God's garden of grace, even the weak trees bear fruit. And so, if you look in the Bible, it's kind of the who is who of weak people. The who is who of failures. Those are the people that God used. Look at uh, Abraham. He was a liar. David, he was an adulterer. Um, Moses, he had a temporal problem. Peter was impulsive. David, I mentioned. Jeremiah had, uh, had thoughts of depression. Elijah had burnout. Paul was a persecutor of Christians. They all had their stuff. They were all weak. But God loved to use them because he doesn't look Nearly as much as you think at your ability, but he looks at your credibility, your dependability, and your availability, right? Ten years ago, some of you know the story, my wife and family and everybody, and we moved here to Berlin. Um, ten years ago, to plant a church here in Berlin. Not this one, but we're involved with a different ministry then. And at the time, I thought it was going to be a good idea if I meet up with some kind of key leaders of other churches in the city. And I met up with a president, kind of the denominational leader of a particular denomination that I'm not going to mention to you now. Okay. <laughs> I can tell you later. No, I'm not going to tell you. <laughs> um, and I was sitting in his office, and he leaned back in his big chair. And I was even thinking like, man, one day I'm going to have a big chair and not work at a coffee house. Anyways, but he had a big chair, and he, he basically said, who invited you to come here to Berlin and plant a church? Who told you to do this? Like, we didn't as a denomination. Did any other denomination call you to? Like, and I was like, uh, Jesus? You know, but I didn't want to be, you know. I, but he basically was saying, he was really kind of skeptical of, of, of that, that vision that I had to plant a church. And he would said the line, who do you think you are? You can just come here and plant a church. And you, looking back, I can smile at it now because it was like, what an idiot. But <laughs> it's being recorded, isn't it? But yeah, okay. Uh, but um, back then, it really messed with my head. It really messed with me. It was like, and I believed it. I was like, yeah, maybe this is a stupid idea. Maybe we made a mistake moving here. Well, who do we think we are that we think we can just come to Berlin and plant a church? And then I, it dawned on me that it's the wrong question. The question is not, who do I think I am? question is, who do I think God is? It's his idea. He, he had this idea to get this church planted, and so I'm going to get behind his idea, and so it doesn't matter what I think I am. I'm weak. I know I don't have what it takes to do this, but I believe God is in this. Therefore, I'm going to do it, right? Nehemiah's response to all of this is amazing. Just like in the beginning, again here we can see he just turned to prayer. That was his response to almost any challenge in his life. He always turned to prayer. Whenever you're being ridiculed, you hold on to the hand of God. Okay? So that's the first one. The second opposition that we face, I've got to speed up a bit. The second opposition that we face is when you're right in the middle of the work. Okay? You're not just in the beginning. You've actually come quite a, quite a long way. Let's read in chapter 4, verse 6. It says, At last the wall was completed to half of its height. 
and the wall is half of its height, you're halfway there, okay? So they were about halfway done around this entire city, for the people had worked with enthusiasm. Wonderful. It was great joy. Thank you for doing this. But when Sanballat and Tobiah and the Arabs, Ammonites, and Ashdodites heard that the work was going ahead and that the gaps in the wall of Jerusalem were being repaired, they were furious. They all made plans to come and fight against Jerusalem. Now, you need to know geography. Sanballat was in the north. The Arabs were in the south. Uh, Tobiah, the Ammonites, lived east of Jerusalem, and the men of Ashdod were kind of west of Jerusalem just before the beach, okay? So they were coming at Jerusalem now from all sides, and they wanted to come and fight against Jerusalem and uh, throw us into confusion, he says. They were saying, before they know what's happening, we will swoop down on them and kill them and end their work. The second opposition that you face is a full frontal attack. If they can't get you with the ridicule, they're going to try to attack you uh, full on ahead. Like you're right in the middle of God's work. You're actually seeing things are happening. Man, we can see some fruit for our labor even. God is doing wonderful things. And then suddenly, in the midst of all of this, like it even says they had enthusiasm. They were, they were, they were joyful about what was happening. And suddenly in the middle of all of this, there is confusion. There is um, illness. There is uh, trouble, there's division, there's danger. Suddenly, everything seems to go wrong. And we even read a little later in verse 10 that the people then were getting tired. They were frustrated with the workload and they were getting scared of the enemies that have drawn their swords, right? When that happens, when we're in a situation like this as well, what we tend to often say is, we must be outside the will of God, right? If we were in the will of God, this would not be happening. We wouldn't have all the problems. We're having problems. We must be outside the will of God. And guys, that's exactly the wrong answer. The fact that you're facing some opposition might actually be proof that you're right in the middle of the will of God. Okay? It's, uh, when Jesus called us and sent us out, he never promised that it would be easy. In fact, he said, you will have trouble. You will have opposition. You will face persecution even. Like he, he never promised an easy ride. And uh, the way to know that you're not in the will of God actually is when the enemy leaves you alone. Because the enemy only attacks you when you're a threat to him. So you can celebrate, hey, I'm a problem for the enemy. That's a good thing. I must be in the will of God. Does that make sense? It's a shift in your mindset maybe. Nehemiah's response to this, again, the same thing. He turned to prayer. He looked for God and he found God in the midst of all this difficulty. And he says, God, we're trusting you. We're trusting in you that you will defend us in this. And uh, when you're attacked, guys, don't take it out on people. Talk it out with God. Don't take it out on people. Talk it out with God. God, you need to handle this. God, you've called us here. God, this was your idea. This is a problem for you, not for us. You need to sort this out. You need to defend us, okay? And then as Nehemiah was praying, he realized he had three options. The first option for him was to um, basically give up. Well, he wasn't going to do that. The second option was to leave the wall behind and go out of the city and attack the surrounding tribes for him to start the war. He also didn't do that. He did the third thing. He continued with his assignment, but he was prepared. He prepared the people to defend themselves difference between attacking and defending, right? Here's what we, I think we can learn from Nehemiah is never leave your assignment, never leave your wall to attack your enemy, right? You can actually spend so much time and energy, you can waste so much time and energy by trying to diffuse any fires around you. It's like, oh, I need to take care of this, I need to take care of this, I need to grease this squeaking wheel, like this critic or this complainer, like I need to give attention to this. That, that actually becomes your focus, and you're not getting to your assignment because you don't have time for any of this. Nehemiah has been smart. Like he, he did adjust the way they were operating because he actually said half of you are going to keep building, the other half you're going to arm up and you're going to defend wherever you're standing around the wall, and that actually slowed things down, but it was a defense mode. He didn't actually spend time planning an attack. Does that make sense, what I'm trying to say? I think he's been very smart about this. Um, in the Bible, we often read the word, uh, the, the phrase, watch and pray. Jesus said this, John said this, Peter, Paul, they've all kind of repeated this, watch and pray. This is what Nehemiah did. He prayed, and then he 
he had lookouts. See, he watched, was ready to defend themselves, but he just kept going with what he was called to do. Okay? Um, the third opposition, then, is when you're nearly there, when you're almost done. You can see the fruit of your labor. God has done miracles like you're celebrating already. There comes a third opposition that we need to be ready for. Uh, and now we go to Nehemiah chapter 6. Let me read this. Sambalat, uh, you still with me? Yeah, cool. Sambalat, <laughs> Tobiah, Geshem the Arab, and the rest of our enemies found out that I had finished rebuilding the wall and that no gaps remained, though we had not yet set up the doors and the gates. So basically they were done. They just had to close the door, right? <laughs> that was it. They were, they, were, they were almost done. And then it says, Sambalat and Geshem sent a message, a letter, asking me to meet them in Kefirim in the plain of Ono. Okay, uh, it's a bit weird, but what was happening in the following verses, let me just tell it to you, is that basically Sambalat had said, sent a letter to Nehemiah, and he was in the letter he was saying, look, Nehemiah, there's a rumor going around here among the tribes that Sambalat had started. There's a rumor going around here that you are going to crown yourself as king over the whole region once you're done with your wall. Now, King Artaxerxes, who's still kind of the emperor over all of this, he's not going to be very happy when he hears about this. And he says, Nehemiah, look, we've had our differences in the past. Why don't we meet together in the town of Kithirim, in the plain of Ono, and we give a little and you give a little. I'm sure we can find a way to compromise. The, the third and the most subtle attack that you will face is when you're almost done Suddenly, there is this temptation to compromise. The temptation to compromise. And Nehemiah, he was sharp. He knew Kefirim in the plain of Ono. That was about 20 miles north of Jerusalem. And he realized, if I go there, I'm going to delay the building project. I'm going to distract my focus and I'm possibly even endangering my life because this could be a trap. And so he says, I'm no fool. I'm not going to go meet in the plain of Ono to drink kefir with Sanvalat. That was a joke. Some of you got it. Kefirim, right? Kefirim. I was so excited about this joke all week. I was excited. And it didn't work. Okay. Anyways, he was saying... <laughs> I don't have time for this. These are false accusations anyways. I don't have time for this. I have, a I have a wall to build. I have a door to close here in Jerusalem, right? And here's the thing. You can spend your time either by trying to correct all the criticism around you or by pursuing the assignment that God gave you, right? Nehemiah, he said, I don't have time for this. These are lies. They're going to die anyways. It's not true. Like, my integrity is stronger than this. Like, he was so confident. Don't you love this? He was so confident. Confident people stay calm. It's insecure people who get loud. He's just calm. He's, he's confident. And he actually, in verse 8, we read, I sent him this reply. Nothing like what you are saying is happening. You are just making it up out of your own head. Like, I love this guy. He's, he's just so focused. He's so determined. And then he actually finished the wall. He did close the, the gates of the door. And he, within 52 days, they were actually done rebuilding the wall. What 90, day, 90 years nobody could accomplish within 52 days, they've actually made it happen. And Nehemiah, I love him because he refused to argue. He refused to debate. He refused to get distracted. He refused to give up. He refused to compromise despite of all his opposition. They were almost done, which means they were now most exhausted. And when you're most exhausted, you're most tempted to compromise. But Nehemiah said, no, no. Like he, like he didn't say, listen, we've accomplished most of what we had vision for. Let's just draw the line here and call it a day. Let's all go home. Like we, we've built the wall. So what? The gate is open. But we have, you know, <laughs> it's kind of like you don't need the wall if the gate is open. Like you actually need to finish this. Don't compromise on this very last essential piece. But he said... Uh, we're not going to compromise. Guys, I've observed this. Um, persistence and resilience will take you further in your life than your talent, your education, your innovation, your intellect, all of these things. Persistent and resilience will actually take you further than that. Because we all know people who are sharp. They're, they're clever. They have great ideas. They're very talented, but they're not successful. 
right? Why? Because they give up too early. They don't see it through until the very end. They give up too soon, and uh, they're, they're making the mistake of uh, being willing to compromise. And they're almost there. I don't want us to be that kind of church who compromises on what God calls us to do. I want us to go all the way, right? When you pursue a dream, a calling on your life, you may be tempted to give up because of, actually, there's three things that may tempt you to give up. It's either uh, problems, what is it, problems, pressure, or people. Problems, because every great idea has problems. You need to solve them, and even when you solve them, there's going to be new problems, right? So when, when you try to do things, there's always going to be problems. Pressure is... Because, hey, you, 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 you're trying to do something new, and after a while, you'll be like, oh, man, I'm so tired. Like, this is actually a lot of pressure. Like, I'm, I'm just, I just want to throw in the towel. Like, I'm, I'm done with this. I can't handle the pressure. Nehemiah actually didn't have that problem because he was a master in delegation. We didn't talk about this today, but he, you can study this at home, of how he shared the responsibility with loads and loads of people. So he, he wasn't under pressure much. And the third kind of reason why you may be tempted to throw in the towel is because of other people. Because every person that you're ever going to work with is a broken person. Every person on the planet is broken. And sometimes we can be frustrating with each other. Sometimes we can be misunderstanding each other. Sometimes it can be difficult to work together. And sometimes that's the reason why people give up, because of problems, of pressure, or of people. Don't do that. I want to actually, can I just ask you a straight up question? What is it in your life right now that you're thinking about giving up? What is it in your life right now that you are thinking, like, I'm done with this? Maybe your prayer life. Maybe you're reading the Bible. Maybe something in your work. Maybe you're thinking about giving up your education. Maybe you're thinking about giving up an, a relationship, a marriage even, maybe. Because it's just too much pressure, too many problems. This person is just such a big problem, Right? What is it where you're thinking, like, I'm going to give this up? Maybe it's, it's a ministry. Maybe it's your small group. Maybe it's church altogether. It's like, I don't even know why I'm here. I want to just tell you, whatever it is in your life, don't do it. Keep on. Hold on. Maybe you want to write down this sentence, actually. If I give up, the enemy wins. If I give up now, the enemy wins. I'm not going to compromise. I'm not going to do it. Nehemiah's response to all of this, you guessed it, again, he turned to prayer. He was a prayer addict, <laughs> right? That's all he did. Like, with any problem, like, it seems all the time, it was like, oh, that's a problem. Let's talk, about the, talk to the Lord about this problem, right? All, that was his go-to thing. Like, he always prayed about it. And again here, he uh, turned to prayer. In Luke chapter 18, Jesus told his disciples to pray and not give up. Have you heard this? Pray and do not give up. In your life, you're going to do either one or the other. You're either going to pray or you're going to give up. You're either going to pray or you're going to panic. You're either going to worry, worship or you're going to worry. Right? Pray and don't give up is what Jesus is saying, especially when the heat is on, when the pressure is on. I just want to mention in our church, in this new season, one of the things I'm really excited about is that we want to become more intentional about our corporate prayer life. Um, because we, we have all kinds of groups and little pockets of people who, who get together to pray. But I'd love to bring this all together. And so we have more prayer life together. If you're anything like me, like I know I, I need to be like Nehemiah when there's a problem, I need to go pray. But I'm not like Nehemiah because sometimes I don't even have the energy or the faith to pray. And so what helps me, and maybe you're wired like me as well, is when there are other people who pray with me. And they actually drag me along to pray. And that actually calls me in to pray again. Like, because on my own, I don't do it as much as I should. Like the 10 minutes, the one hour kind of <laughs> I play that game all the time, right? And so we want to do that. And we're thinking about introducing a monthly prayer meeting in an evening. Some worship, just praying together, no agenda, not a big setup like a Sunday service. We're just kind of getting together in a room like this or somewhere to just pray together and come before the Lord in prayer. Uh, we'll, we'll write more about this in the next newsletter, so sign up on the contact card if you want to receive those. But let me just close with this. The most resilient, the most determined, the most focused, the most never-give-up type man who ever lived wasn't even Nehemiah. It was Jesus. Jesus was unstoppable. And just like Nehemiah, Jesus also had a place at the right hand of the king in the palace. 
And just like Nehemiah, Jesus was also moved and his heart was broken when he heard, when he saw the condition of his people. That was very good that you just kind of, did you see that? He's just like, wow, come on. <laughs> you just stepped up there, wow. <laughs> All right, so just like Nehemiah, Jesus was also, what did I want to say? Like he was moved by the plight of his people. And just like Nehemiah, Jesus also left his place in the palace to come for us, to come to us, to repair all that's broken so we could be saved, right? And just like Nehemiah, Jesus also called others along, us, the church, to be part of this, of this rebuilding of things, okay? That's what he did as well. While he was on earth, Jesus was also ridiculed, Jesus was also attacked. Jesus was mocked. They also schemed and made plots and plans to assassinate him and to come after his life. They actually did come after his life. And he willingly stepped into that plot that they've created. And he stepped into it knowing full well what's going to happen because he knew that was his calling. He was unstoppable. And he, he gave his life, guys. He gave his life to pay for your sin, for my sin, so that everything within us and around us could be repaired and renewed and restored and that we could be saved. That's the gospel. That's what Jesus came to do and nothing could stop him. He was determined. He was focused. He did not give up. He did not compromise on this mission that he had. If ever anybody was unstoppable, it was Jesus. Amen. And he did that for you and he did that for me. The story of Nehemiah is inspiring, but it's historical. Jesus' story is also historical, but it is also very personal. That's what Jesus did for you, to come for you, to save you, to restore you, to protect you. And just like Nehemiah, he turned to God whenever he faced oppositions. We can turn to Jesus whenever the headwinds come, whenever the pushbacks come. We, we hold on to him. And Jesus promised, I'm going to give you power I'm going to empower you. I'm going to give you strength. I'm going to give you my Holy Spirit power so that you can defy the headwinds as they come. Let's pray together. If you want to stand with me, let's, let's, let's pray together and, uh, and turn to Jesus now. Jesus, we thank you for um, the story of Nehemiah that is encouraging to us because there's so many things we can learn about persistence and resilience and and keeping our focus even when there's attacks and opposition around us. And there's many of us here uh, who feel like in this new season, there's, there's something that you have in store for us. There's something you're calling us to. We feel that for us as a church, that in this new season, Lord, we want to step into whatever it is that you have for us. We'll be putting our yes on the table and say, yes, God, whatever it is that you have for us, that's what we want to pursue because we know your plans, they're wonderful, they're perfect, they're the timing of it all is all perfect. We trust it. We're excited about it. We anticipate so many wonderful things that you have in store for us. But we also know that when we step out in faith, when we say yes like this, uh, that the enemy has a problem with it. And he, he will try, uh, he's going to throw everything against us. And he's going to try to ridicule our ideas. He's going to try to attack us and even might try to tempt us to compromise. Oh, Jesus, we want to hold on to you. We want to hold on to our calling and, and, and not... Like Nehemiah, he, he, he wasn't distracted by any of this. He was determined. We want to be a, a church that reflects that. Jesus, we thank you that you're that kind of Savior who is unstoppable. And Lord, I also want to thank you that, that you, you love to use weak people. Nehemiah, he was a strong character, but he also had his flaws. We didn't talk about them today. Uh, and maybe this message feels a bit overwhelming to a couple of people in the rooms like, well, I'll never be like that. Jesus, help us to remember that you love to use weak people and that our strength only and always comes from you so lord fill us now as we sing these songs as we turn to you we look to you like fill us again with new vision new hope and new determination to go for it in jesus name amen amen